Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Steph Figarelli. She's a pal of mine, and we met through a coaches group a while back and how to do a podcast one day, so here we are. Steph is the co-owner of Figarelli's Fitness. She's a podcast host of The Fit Fig, and she's an avid hiker and runner who lives in Anchorage, Alaska. Steph loves helping people feel comfortable in the gym and in their bodies, and she's a master at helping people achieve their fitness goals and their non-fun fitness goals, too. Now, Steph got into fitness with competitive bodybuilding in high school and fell in love with the realization that she could change her body with food and exercise. Steph's all about educating and how it's never too late to get into incredible shape and live the life you want. Now, I know Steph's Instagram posts make me want to get in outdoor shape and explore the epic places she's adventuring, that's for sure. Steph's currently working on a goal of finishing a 100-mile ultra marathon. Now, that's impressive. Steph drops a lot of nuggets from her extensive experience that you don't want to miss. So let's introduce you to Steph Figarelli. Hey, Steph, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Thank you for having me. Man, I'm so excited to talk to you. It's been like, I don't know, maybe three years since we talked about doing this first. And now I'm like, finally, the day is here. So thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Hey, so like, you know, we're both over 40 and and a lot of people are are kind of going, you know, asking me like, okay, doc, I know you work out. I know you lift. What do you do? You know, I don't know if I can do what you're doing, but is it even worth it for women over 40? Because we've got this whole thing of people saying, just walk, don't lift. Then there's all the folks with their like hit and then some lifting and then their circuit training. I mean, you name it, you know, as well as I do, there's a bajillion things out there. So of course you are kind of my, my go-to when I, when folks are like, well, can I really build muscle over 40? I'm like, Hey, look at this website. You gotta look at stuff. She's got amazing muscles going on there. So tell us a little bit about your journey. Cause you were telling me you started noticing things changing a little bit in your thirties. And then now you're like, okay, I got to tweak things a little bit. Give us a little scoop on, on your story. So women can maybe resonate a little bit and see, Oh, that might sound like me. Yeah. So when I was a kid, I was pretty active, but I wasn't by any means, uh, you know, like the big jock in school. Um, I was a swimmer. I played softball. Um, I was on the track team, but I didn't ever feel like I was an athlete or that I was a particularly fit person. I didn't grow up hiking. I've grown, I grew up in Alaska for the most part. Uh, and I just wasn't really outdoorsy. And so I didn't have this identity attached to physical fitness in the way that I have it now. And that I'm in every day, I'm surprised when I, when I think back on that beginning and when I think about where I am today, um, how how interesting this all this whole journey has been but i remember when i was in junior high my mom was dating a guy who was really into going to the gym so i was about 13 and they would go to the gym and i would tag along every now and then now this is the 90s like 90 <laughs> 93 so big you know big bodybuilders were becoming more and more popular and i remember flipping through a magazine i found at this gym and I saw this guy's quads and I couldn't believe that it was even a human being. I was like, it, it blew my mind. I became almost like obsessed with seeing this superhuman, you know, these bodies that just looked unbelievable. And I thought, wow, going to the gym, you know, can, can you, you can build a body like this by just exercising. Like, that's crazy. Now I didn't know a whole lot about like steroids and things. And so, <laughs> That was later when I finally figured out like, oh, okay, most of these people are probably using some sort of assistance to get to this level of muscularity. Um, but overall, the idea was, or, or the fascination was around changing your body with fitness and food. And so I was just obsessed. I mean, I all through high school, even a little bit, I, I always kind of entertained lifting weights and getting fit. So I eventually started to take it seriously when I was a senior in high school. Um, we have a local bodybuilding competition at all the high schools. It's at the end of the year. Um, and all the high schools will come together and compete against each other too. So one, you know, each high school has their show. And then, it, then there, there's another show where then all the winners can come together and compete against all the other high schools. So I ended up competing in and winning my 
high school bodybuilding competition. So this was old school, just basic flexing, you know, all the things <laughs> on stage in a bikini, uh, way out of my comfort zone. And um, I just fell in love with it. It was like the biggest high I could have ever imagined. And I was 18, I graduated high school shortly thereafter. And I thought, I got to figure out a way to make money doing this because I love it and I want to do it forever. But I also have to find, I also want to teach people that you have control, you have the power, you can change your body by just getting up and going to the gym and doing a specific sequence of things the right way consistently over time. Um, and then eating correctly, of course. And I was fascinated by the psychology behind that. And I wanted, I wanted people to feel what I felt. And after high school, I did the exact opposite of that. I got into partying and just kind of hardcore, not healthy at all. Um, but I always felt this pull to go back to it. I ended up getting a job at GNC, General Nutrition Center. I don't know if it's still around everywhere. We still have a couple here. Yeah. In, in, um, I became a manager there. And so I was always linked to fitness, health, supplements, bodybuilding in some way. So I always had that kind of like foundation. And it wasn't through sports. It was always bodybuilding. And lifting weights and just learning that whole process. So um, I competed from 2000 to 2009 and I, I semi-retired. I always say semi-retired because I don't know, maybe I'll go back one day. Um, <laughs> but having competed since 2009 and shortly thereafter got actually into running. And so that was the opposite also of what I yeah. would have in bodybuilding because it can be very catabolic. It's very hard on the, the you know, the, the body in, in a lot of different ways. And I just fell in love with that. So I kept bodybuilding, but I introduced now hiking and running and eventually ultra running. Um, and I started to notice some things in the, we'll say like the off season in Alaska, the off season would be probably, uh, October to, to, uh, May we'll say, which is a long period of time to where you're yeah. not really spending as much time outside. And, and a lot of people here do, they ski, they do a lot of things outside. And I, I just haven't, I'm not a huge skier. Like I'll, I'll, have, I'll snowboard, but so in my probably like 37, 38, so I'm 42 now, I started to notice some things with, um, unusual fatigue and not being able to get away with eating food that I normally could eat before fun foods, you know, like cakes, cookies, and ice cream. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, maybe it's because I'm not, it's the off season. I'm not as active right now. And, and that's, there's a correlation there, of course, but I noticed fat distribution was a little bit different. Um, I noticed cellulite in new places and, and it wasn't like I was, I was like, you know, negatively uh, feeling negatively about it necessarily. It was just, a, it was like, oh, that's, that's interesting. It's new. Because mm -hmm. uh, once I discovered bodybuilding and had built all these really great habits, uh, it's almost like, you know, your, your habits will pull you in that direction. You don't really have to work hard to, to follow those habits. They're just, it's like a gravitational pull toward the things that you're most, you know, you've been doing most often, and that could be good or bad. Um, and so I just, I realized like things are changing a little bit here in a way that I don't feel quite as, I also noticed this level of intensity was starting because I've always been a pretty intense, aggressive person gravitating toward bodybuilding or, you know, kind of like just being really active, you know, running and doing all this, like kind of what I thought were like intense, crazy things. And I noticed my, my drive for that was declining a little bit, almost like I felt not quite as like intense. I don't know how else to explain it. I thought, oh, things are kind of changing here a little bit. Um, and I didn't really, you know, I didn't, I didn't do anything about it necessarily. Um, if anything, I kind of just went with the flow of the change I kept up with my lifting. I always have. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of where I, I noticed some things changing. It was about five, six years ago. Um, and if I really think back and look through journals, cause I journal, I've journaled for all my workouts for, I mean, 12, 13 years, pretty consistently. So I have stacks of notebooks where I could look through and go, Oh, maybe there were correlations and you know, maybe there was a decline in, in my consistency. Maybe I was doing something. I haven't really ever picked through and, and <laughs> looked at that closely. So there could be something to that as well, but.
It, I mean, it's interesting, right? When when you have journaled, myself included, like I have these like stacks of the old school notebooks, the the app stuff, not my jam. You know, I like the old school too. And I look, you know, I have looked back on myself, but I need like a series of like two weeks of rainy days where maybe I could justify it. But I have seen like, yeah, it's like all of a sudden there's like a decline in 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 the be able to the max reps, right? And there's like a little bit of where I have notes of where I'm like so tired today. Not sure why. And it like increases over time. And it's like, I'm dragging. Then you try to connect to period and be like, is there something there? And sometimes you're like, I have, I have no stinking clue. Have you noticed the same thing in your clients as you've been working with folks as they get from like the late 30s into the 40s and beyond? Yeah, it's um, it's different for everyone. That's something I have noticed is no two women are alike. And some women haven't really noticed much change through menopause, which is fascinating to me when, you know, it depends on a lot of things too. Um, if, if a woman's had a partial hysterectomy, for example, she's, uh, has ovaries, but no uterus, she doesn't know when her menstrual cycle is going to stop because it's been gone. And, uh, you know, or, you know, it's obviously it's <laughs> uterus being removed. There's no period. So it's like, there aren't these telltale signs of change for some women. And then other women go through menopause fairly early, way earlier than you would you know, traditionally we've been taught that you go, Oh, you go through menopause around 50, 50, 52 or whatever. Um, and some women have had zero discussion with their own mothers or grandmothers for whatever reason. Uh, and so they don't really know what to expect. And it's not to say that we're going to be exactly like our mothers or what our grandmothers went through, but there's some, sometimes a theme there with genetics and things. Um, so there's different conversations I've had with different women around, what it means. Uh, some women can be very anxious. So uh, I'm always mindful when I discuss this with my female clients who are of the age of perimenopause, where they're really noticing the changes because some women can be very, um, it's a, it's a touchy, touchy subject and they're not willing to really talk about it, uh, which can make it hard for you as the coach, because it's like, well, I mean, it's, this is checking all the boxes anxiety, fatigue, uh, difficulty sleeping, all kinds of different things that are affecting your ability to recover, which will affect your ability to build muscle. Um, and some women emotionally can't go there. And so you have to be pretty careful with the conversation because mm -hmm. not everybody is, I'm super open. There's no TMI. I don't <laughs> do that with my clients are welcome to talk about anything they want to discuss. We talk about bowel movements, menstrual cycles, we talk about everything. Uh, but some people don't want to go there. And then you know, I back off and I, and I, and I let it go, but um, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's some women who go through it. It's rough and others don't really notice it. So, man, yeah. I hope as I move forward, I am one that does not get the hot flashes and, and all that. Like, I'm like, I do not want to notice it. Hopefully right. my like, body, please, please let's be, let's be chill. Hopefully all this work I put into now will, will go forward. Um, yes. Help help a sister out here. Now, you know, for a lot of women, one of the things, you know, the fatigue's a big deal, right? And and regardless of whether there is, you know, some wonkiness with hormones or whatnot, I, I get a lot of women who will say like they're bonking in the middle of their workouts or they'll do a workout and that's all they can do. They go home and they're like out. Do you have any suggestions or any things you've seen around that and kind of how to navigate the fatigue situation what do you guys do what do you do in your particular practice with folks uh so personally i am a big big proponent my clients get so annoyed with me because it's difficult for sleep is hard it's even more difficult for moms or parents in general but moms tend to be the ones who are having sleep disturbances the most. Um, and then if they're in their mid forties or, or in you know, perimenopause and they're experiencing maybe some disruptions due to hormonal fluctuation or whatever, um, then that's the added thing on top of it. Another stressor for us here in Alaska is now we are in our long daylight months. And so it's sun is coming up around 3 34 AM and it doesn't set until I think like 11 or 12. And so in the summer for like three months, people are really trying to spend as much time outside as they possibly can. So that's affecting their ability to go to bed early. Um, and then they're tired in the morning, but we have that daylight at least to help us wake up. Um, so for me, I am 
very consistently going to bed and waking up at exactly the same time, seven days per week. Uh, I do not have a television in my room. My phone is off and in another room when I sleep. Um, I have blackout curtains, so no light gets in. And I've actually started sleeping with a sleep mask. I wear earplugs. I live, I live on a super busy street. So for people who don't have all these interruptions, they probably don't need all these extra things, but um, I guard my sleep and I am very protective over that go to bed and wake up at the same time thing. And people think it's weird. You know, they're just like, that's insane. Um, but I have to do it to keep that consistency because if you go to bed and wake up at a different time every day, or you sleep, sleep in on the weekends, you don't feel better necessarily. Some people might, but I always felt more fatigued if I got sleep, you know, too much sleep on the weekends. And then I'd start all over on Monday or Sunday night or whatever, trying to fix it. Um, so I decided seven days a week, no matter where I'm at, sleep is the priority. Uh, my dog has his own bed. He's not allowed on my bed. Uh, I don't want any disturbance. Um, so I'm eliminating all disturbances before before bed, anything that's going to distract me. And I start kind of winding down before. These are all suggestions I make and have made for many years with all of my clients, and they do their very best. So it's one thing, I don't have children. I don't have a lot of distractions or things to manage. So I can't be over here like, well, I'll do this, do that. Um, because I know, I don't feel like I have any place to say that with when, with not having kids, I have a very manageable lifestyle. Um, but sleep is very important because if you're in a sleep deficit, it's going to be difficult to get through a workout because now you're adding more stress. Um, so one thing that has been a significant change for me is drinking an intra-workout carb drink while I train. So I found a really good one. Um, it's a recovery drink from Granite Fitness. And uh, I'm a big John Meadows fan. If anybody's familiar with John Meadows, um, he has uh, he's passed away, uh, but he has a supplement line called Granite Fitness. And I, I just was on a big John Meadows kick a couple of years ago and I was buying all these supplements and I just fell in love with this drink. It's, um, it's primarily sugar, uh, but I love the way I feel in the gym. And there's, I've tried different things to try to get off of it. Um, <laughs> I'm like, ah, coconut water is just as good or whatever, something with carbs. Uh, because if I'm not drinking something like that during, I don't have a big breakfast before I train, I typically train at 6 a.m. So I'm not eating a ton of food. So if somebody's working out early, or even later in the day, consider bringing with you an intra workout shake, something maybe with a, this doesn't have, I don't think any protein in it. Um, but something to where your blood sugar isn't going to crash because that that's made all the difference for me. So even if it's a little bit of juice or whatever, you know, something to keep the blood sugar up, uh, because it keeps your intensity in the workout high. If you start to fade 20 minutes in and your blood sugar is dropping, you're hungry, your workout's going to suck and you're not going to be able to, to push hard enough to build any muscle. So sleep and that intra workout drink have been huge for me. Um, and then, you know, thankfully when I, after I work out, I'm energized. So I haven't noticed any sort of crashing or fatigue after the workout. Um, in fact, it's always the opposite. I work out to get more energized. How, and one benefit too, that I've noticed is I'm, by the time I'm ready to sleep within about 30 minutes, I am exhausted on days I lift, which allows me to fall asleep faster and stay asleep. So that's been awesome. So I would say, I would suggest if somebody is having issues related to fatigue, I mean, definitely get, you know, blood work and check on things, go, you know, check under the hood, make sure everything <laughs> is okay, but then take a really honest look at your sleep and see where you can regulate it a little bit, maybe get some morning sunlight uh, for, for a few minutes and just kind of like get yourself, wake yourself up. Um, and then experiment with something where you're either eating up something light before you train or something within the workout, you're drinking something rather, cause your digestive system might be affected by food. Um, and that has made all the difference for me is just, yeah. Having that little blood sugar, you know, increase while I'm training. So that, I mean, makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. And you kind of got me into an idea. I'm like, hmm, because I'm one of those early worker outers. 
I cannot eat before. Otherwise, I have this like terrible fear of barfing. I don't know what it is. Um, yeah. just totally there. Um, but yeah, I I have found some some crashing a little bit. And I wonder if it is timing from dinner, you know, going into the workout. There's just not I, I'm out of gas. I need more fueling. Makes sense. Yeah, try it. It's been awesome. And I mean, I push so much harder in that workout when I have a little sugar. My body responds very well to a little bit of sugar. Not like I'm a you know over here eating a bunch of candy and stuff, but <laughs> um, but that could be a thing too. People eat sour patch kids while they're working out just for the the boost in um blood sugar and uh and I feel I feel great when I drink that. I've tried like I said, I've tried quitting it. It's not a cheap product and I'm like, oh gotta be other things. I've tried even other recovery type drinks with carbs and I can't find the same thing. So, so it's called huh. recovery granted fitness. If you're ever interested, uh, yeah. it's awesome. And I love it. So, Hey, you, you, we heard it here. We heard it here. We'll make sure we get that in the podcast notes guys at Dr. Jake because that one I'm, I'm definitely going to try because I am noticing a little of fatigue myself. I'm, I have some clients that are kind of talking about it too, in terms of their workouts and you know, it, it makes sense, right? It makes sense. If we had dinner at five o'clock the night before, and now we're doing a workout 12 hours later, if we didn't, you know, if we burned through whatever that dinner was, well, you know, or if we're doing some, you know, we skipped dinner, which is a whole nother thing. I want to talk about food for a minute and talk about blood sugar in general, because yeah. I find, I mean, I also don't have kids, so I also can't say anything about the mom, mom life, but I, I do see that sometimes if I get busy, I will forget to eat a meal. And dinner is often one of the ones I actually forget versus earlier in the day because after workouts, I am hungry. So let's talk about skipping meals and let's talk about blood sugar balance in terms of the other side of it versus supplementing in between a workout. What have you been working with your folks on and what have you found with yourself with blood sugar? So I am, again, <laughs> I this is one I don't preach to clients because I I – I don't think a lot of people, it's not going to really work with a lot of people. So I got into intermittent fasting like eight years ago, hardcore, um, and would fast for 16 hours and my eating window was eight hours. And it took me a few weeks to like figure that all out, but I was really interested in seeing what it was all about. You know, there was a ton of hype around it back then and there still is today. Um, what I noticed as I got really strict with it was first of all, I loved I stopped eating by 12:30 PM every day. I think it was. So I would eat, I, w I wake up pretty early in the morning. And so I'd start, I'd have like an RX bar, my coffee, get into my morning workout with whatever I was consuming. Um, and then on throughout the day for about eight hours, have that window and then stop eating. So I actually noticed kind of this, like really almost like a high cortisol stressed out feeling the longer I did it. And so I noticed I loved the routine and the regimented way of living and organizing my life because I could be done. I could brush my teeth by 1230 PM floss, be done with like daily, like end of day tasks super early. Um, but then I had to be mindful of my energy later in the day. Say I went out with friends and I, I hadn't been eating, you know, for however many hours and hours I had to, that could impact my social life because of dinners and things I couldn't necessarily have with friends or, would be interfered with at least. And, and I wanted to like not be a total weirdo. So I would, you know, figure it out. Um, and so as far as like the gym or anything like that, uh, I didn't notice like huge impacts in, in anything significant. Um, I ended up getting pretty lean. What The first year I did it, um, I was training for a race and like a running race. Uh, and so I was trying to get my body weight down to around 115 pounds and I ended up losing over the course of several months, like 30 pounds to get ready for this. And so like my routine was very regimented. My activity level was high. I'm sure I lost some muscle in the process, but it wasn't really about being a bodybuilder at that point. It was about being able to race in under a certain amount of time and not get hurt and stuff like that. So um, as far as blood sugar fluctuations and things like that, I think I am fairly sensitive to that. But as I got into intermittent fasting, I was um, and I didn't consume anything. I wasn't having like, you know, even electrolytes and stuff. I'll, I, I take electrolytes every day and I've done long fasts and stuff where I consume an electrolyte drink. Um, but you know, as far as like clients and stuff like that, um, 
nobody has really said anything as far as like the impact on that. I've suggested things like the intro workout drink for blood sugar crashes where people are feeling kind of nauseous. We're just eating closer to the time they're training if possible. Um, yeah, it's not been no, nothing too significant there. Um, with clients, uh, I think, you know, I can, I can tell clients what I do and make suggestions, but you can't make people follow your way <laughs> if it's stressful or, you know, um, so yeah. Interesting. You mentioned kind of that cortisol -y, anxious -y feeling with the intermittent fasting. I know a lot of my clients have noticed that I myself ended up quitting intermittent fasting because my, I, I had this thing called the lumen. Have you heard of the lumen? I have, yeah. Yeah, I like got one of those and was like, whoa, my blood sugar is like crazy high and I haven't had any food for like 12, 16 hours or something. I'm like, something's wrong here, right? And so I correlated it with the saliva cortisol test and sure enough, my cortisol levels were like, boom, way up there. And I'm like, oh, maybe this is a bad thing. And I had like, was putting on some weight and I'm like, this is so weird. I'm doing my same routine. You know, I haven't changed anything. I was like, whoa this is weird. So what do you, what do you do now? Do you, do you still have somewhat of a fasting regimen or are you three squares a day kind of gal now or what, what's going on? Yeah, no, I do like to stop eating. Usually it depends on the day. So if I have hikes and things I'm doing that throws it all off. Cause if I start hiking at 9 AM and I don't get home until three or 4 PM, I'm going to eat after I get home because I'm going to be tired and just wanting I'm hungry usually. Uh, and I'm eating all day on the trail. So days like that, now in the summertime where I'm hiking quite a few days a week, that whole routine changes. But if it's just an average day, I like to finish eating by probably uh, 1230 or 1 p.m. and just be done with it. Um, and occasionally I'll be hungry. So I go to bed at 730 every night. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> That's and, awesome. Uh, people make fun of me, but I'm like, I just, this is the way it's gotten figured out in my schedule to work best. So by about seven, some nights, if I'm consistently eating like in that intermittent fasting style, I'll notice a little bit of hunger creeping in. Um, but I don't mind it. So it doesn't bother me. I'm going to bed anyway. It doesn't affect my ability to fall asleep. So I'm okay with that. Uh, right now it's all over the place. It's, it's, um, I do track macros. So, um, intermittent fasting really isn't anything I would say I, I do, I do it casually now, just if it's convenient. I don't like to go to bed with a full stomach. I don't like to have that, like, you know, you've had too many, too much, too many carbs or something. And you're just like, I feel all the food in me before bed. I don't like that feeling. So I'll try to cut off food and water even before I go to bed for hours before, um, if possible. Uh, but I do track macros. So I follow, um, with primarily my focus is on total calories and protein, uh, carbs and fat are all over the place from day to day, which is perfectly fine. Um, so, so yeah, really just fueling to, to, um, accommodate whatever I'm doing, you know, outside in the mountains, cause those days can be very long and unpredictable. So, um, and as far as gym, you know, the gym stuff is just making sure the protein is there. So I'm, I am actually able to, to keep the muscle I have and, uh, stay as strong as possible. And so, pro so protein is always a priority for sure. I'm curious what, what, like, give us a breakdown on your macros, just so folks have an example. And then of course I want to go into like building muscle over 40. What does this look like? What, what kind of exercises should we be, be thinking about or what should a exercise like program include in, in your yeah. opinion? So I fluctuate, I'm anywhere from 173 to 177 pounds right now. Um, I am working on, I'm, I'm working on fat loss right now. So I'm, in a deficit most of the time, except for days I, I hike, I'm in a massive surplus because I'm have to eat a lot on the trail, but I'm also burning a ton of calories too. And I don't, uh, I don't look at eating, eating back exercise calories on average days. Um, but I am paying attention to calorie expenditure on a long hiking day. Um, cause this can cut into building muscle too. So this is why I'm kind of adding that part of it in. Um, and so I'm eating anywhere from 21 to 2,300 calories per day. Um, and again, upwards of probably 3000 on days I hike, maybe even more. Um, and there's a little bit of water retention and, and holding of, of water after I like days after I hike because of all the increase in sodium and carbs. Um, but I'm, I do monitor my weight uh, almost daily. And so, um, really just sure that, 
I'm, like I said, consuming protein. So I, I am, I do eat meat. Uh, primarily my protein sources are coming from chicken and beef. I uh, do eat a lot of eggs, egg whites and whey protein shakes when I need them and uh, do supplement with bars when I need them, so whatever's convenient, especially for hiking. Um, and so that's pretty much where macros are at. And then protein is protein can get pretty high. Um, I, I like to feel full. I like to feel satiated and pr protein can help with that. And, um, I mean, it could be upwards of 200 grams of protein in a day and as low as a hundred. And I try not to go lower than about 125. Um, and so protein is always first and foremost, the macro I, I focus on, um, and then of course, total da daily calories. And so, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at right now with, with nutrition stuff. Um, I eat fruit. I, eat, you know, I do eat bacon. Uh, there's really <laughs> nothing I don't eat. I, eat, uh, I should probably eat more vegetables. I do enjoy them. Um, but I, what I like about flexible dieting or if it fits your macros or macro tracking, whatever the names are now, <laughs> is I love that there are parameters with the target numbers, but that I can eat whatever I want. Um, and post bodybuilding life gave me some disordered, you know, distress around eating because I had certain rules I followed very strictly when I was competing. And this way of eating completely changed that for me. It really gave me this freedom and this, um, this love for food. Whereas before I was afraid, um, I'm not a numbers person. I, I like grew up just like the kid who was like failing math. But now with macros, I mean, I love math. I love, I love, <laughs> uh, I love that the math doesn't lie. It works. Um, you know, like whenever, when people are eating intuitively, if they're following a specific type of, I know there's a lot of controversy around this, which is weird now, but um, it's tracking macros is what really gave me the control and control is a, it can be a dirty word for some people, but it really gave me the insight is probably a better word into what was going on when things weren't going the way that I wanted them to go with my body composition. Hey, health junkies, if your feet aren't happy and healthy, the rest of you could suffer from low back pain all the way up to neck pain. And yes, even gut issues can be related to your feet because your feet are connected to your nervous system. Happy feet equal one less thing the nervous system has to worry about. I want to tell you about Paluva. This is a new zero drop minimalist shoe with the distinctive five toe design. Paluvas give you the most authentic barefoot style experience, but with sufficient cushioning to use in everyday movement, fitness, and athletic activities. Paluvas are super stylish, so you also get a barefoot shoe that looks good too. Paluvas are a step ahead of every other zero drop wide box shoe because they feature separate slots for each of your five toes. So if you've been using toe separators, you can ditch them and just wear the Paluvas. Those individual slots for each toe allow for correct dynamic movement of the foot through the walking or running stride, which is important when toes are encased in a single box, even a wide box. Now, Minimalist shoes have faced controversy in recent years about causing injuries from inappropriate use. So you want to get walking in Paluvas, living in Paluvas, and doing whatever you can while you're going barefoot in your home and safe areas as much as possible. So go ahead and use your specialized running shoes, basketball shoes, work boots, high heels when you need to, but wear Paluvas as much as possible to reawaken the natural functionality of the human foot to stand, walk, run, and perform. Try a pair of Paluvas with no risk and you'll quickly realize that these are the most comfortable shoes you've ever worn. They're designed to feel like you're walking barefoot on clouds. So visit Paluva, P-E-L-U-V-A dot com and take 15% off with the code HEALTHFIX. Let's get back to the podcast. Because when I was competing, I didn't track macros. I was terrified. I didn't even understand them. I was like, I don't want to do math. I, <laughs> I didn't track anything. I just checked my weight, took photos, and that was it. And now I have this whole like, this whole system for why something is working. And now, and also I can troubleshoot. I have the insight to troubleshoot when it's not working. Um, but you have to take, you have to, you have to understand the big picture. What the expenditure, the stress aging, hormone related, you know, hor stuff fluctuating. Um, 
but yeah, it's, it's, I feel like I'm in a really just awesome place with my understanding around nutrition today, more so than even just five or 10 years ago. So. Wow. Wow. Your, your clients are lucky because I feel like, you know, a lot of people uh, that, that are coaches, right. Let's, let's be honest. A lot of people are following programs, but they haven't really experimented enough themselves to even know, like, I'll admit, like, I, yeah, same thing with math. I was like, (laughs) macros, math, no, don't want to do it. But when you do do it, you learn a lot. You learn a ton. You, you you learn, one of my clients said it best. She um, was, she ended up losing 35 pounds and maintained it, has maintained it for like six or seven years, if not longer. And maintenance is the hardest part. Once you go through a fat loss transformation or a period of fat loss, state keeping the weight off is the hard part. Um, but what she, the insight she brought to the whole process of working with her was she was like, now I can be creative. Yeah. I have parameters with a certain amount of carbs, fat, and protein to consume, but now I can like get super fun and creative with recipes and things to like hit, the, you know, fit the pieces into the puzzle. And so she had a really cool way of looking at it that I hadn't even considered. And then I have a client right now who is like, she's lost about 40 pounds and she's like, kept it off, but cooks. So she, you have to love to cook with macros because I don't think you have to love it, but you have to, you have to be okay with cooking. And she is really whips up some fun stuff. I'm like, wow, she is impressive. (laughs) Um, But yeah, no macros are intimidating. Um, There's a lot of emotion around that because it can, if it causes people to stress, I'm always like, look, if you have any disordered eating uh, feelings about eating or exercise, this is not a good plan. So if I'm speaking with a potential client on a phone consultation, my, uh, my suggestions are always, if you have a history of eating disorders or issues with control, because you do have to weigh and measure food. You have to check your body weight at least once a week. A lot of people, you know, they're absolutely not. And I'm like, no problem. I understand. Um, my favorite method of doing this is, or working with nutrition and fat loss is with macros. Um, I don't prescribe meal plans. I don't tell my clients what to eat. I, in fact, I'm like encouraging them to fit in, you know, the bad foods that people have grown accustomed to, to, um, cutting out of their diet because they're scared of them. If something makes you feel like crap, when you consume it, don't eat it. If you don't like cookies or you don't want, don't eat it, eat, eat as clean and, you know, whatever you want to call it, eat, eat how you want to eat. But, um, yeah, I don't do, uh, you know, the, the dogmatic way of eating as far as like naming, like, Oh, I only do keto or I only do intermittent fasting or whatever. It's like, it all can work. It's just about what works best for you. What, what can you do without distress, um, consistently enough to get the results that you want? Cause that consistency part is key for sure. Oh, consistency. Yes. <laughs> yes. What a word. What a word. I mean, because it, it fits into the muscle building, right? And and the fat loss and all of that. And you had mentioned two clients, right, that have lost fat. So I'm sure people are listening to this going like, uh, Seth, what'd you do with them? And how did they build muscle? And how did they lose fat? Like, what yeah. what's kind of your, what's your workout scheme for folks? Because we know you got macros on board. What about the workout scheme? What would what would someone over 40 be? What would be like the, the most valuable workout components. Let's put it that way to build muscle. What kind of things should we be doing? Definitely following a program, not showing up to the gym, doing random things. Um, that could work. If you have a lot of experience with lifting weights, you followed programs in the past, but I think at the very least you have to follow a program. Number one, like it, meaning you show up with the plan that's a part of a bigger picture with a specific outcome in mind, uh, whether it's the way you look, whether it's the way you, pr- I primarily work with folks who are trying to change the way that they look, feel, and perform. Um, I don't work with powerlifters, not to say I wouldn't, but I don't have a background in that. So if somebody were interested in, you know, deadlifting 700 pounds, I'm not going to be a great resource for that. Um, I work with general pop who just wants to, to look, look, feel, and perform better and perform meaning like have more energy, feel better at, at home with their spouse or their, or, you know, at work, be more productive, uh, be stronger in the gym, be more physically feeling stronger in the mountains or whatever they're doing. Um, and so that program 
should be customized to the specific goal of the client or the person. So um, people need to get very clear about what they want and why they want it. There needs to be an, an emotional connection to the goal. This is the hardest part that I have found for people because when I'm designing a program, I'm like, you can just rip out a, you know, a workout in a magazine somewhere, just follow that. But if I don't have any real idea of what that thing is going to, that recipe is going to give me, I'm um, just trusting the editors of, you know, the, the muscle magazine to get me where I want to go. They don't know me. I, they don't know what I want. In fact, I haven't even taken the time to think about what I want and why I want it. So I recommend first thinking about the goals that are important to you. And it could be something as simple as I just want to stay injury free, but it should go a step beyond that where you're maybe if you're going to do some sort of a, a race, like a 5k in town or something like that, you have a time goal. Um, and you have like a time goal is, is great because it gives you, there's this concrete number that you can focus on and you can train for that. So the goal will, will help you define and, and create the process. So like, if I have a clear goal, now I know what to do. I can, um, reverse engineer that and I can, I can create a process for that specific outcome. Now, things aren't always perfect. This is life. There are lots of ups and downs. People get sick, people get injured. Um, primarily when I'm working with clients, uh, another one of my main goals with them, which I, I state very clearly up front is to keep you injury free. So the way that we're going to train is in an effort to keep you from getting hurt. Um, and connecting with your body in a way that when even you're outside of the gym, you have this self-awareness, this uh, kinesthetic awareness to where you're not going to get hurt even outside of the gym because you're so aware of the way that your body is moving. Um, you know, even on ice, like that's a big thing here in Anchorage, Alaska is like people fall on the ice and they get severely injured, hitting their head, you know, tearing their ankles. It's like crazy how bad, you know, it probably happens everywhere in places <laughs> where it gets snow and ice, but that's a big thing here. Yeah. Um, so as far as what to choose, as far as, well, what type of program, I have had success with myself for myself and my clients doing a bodybuilding style split. So something like push pull legs, uh, three to five to even six days a week or whole body training. Um, why I choose one or the other really depends again on the client, their goal, but also how much time do you have? You know, if you only have three days a week to train, like I'm not going to tell you, you you'll get the best results doing a bodybuilding style split six days a week, because you're probably going to be very sore, very tired. Um, and because, you know, with bodybuilding style splits, you're going to have like that leg day, like leg and core day or whatever, maybe twice a week, depends again on the client, their goals. But with that focus, that hyper-focus on those muscle groups, you're going to be far more sore than if you're following a whole body split, say like six, seven exercises where you're hitting, you know, legs, chest, back, shoulders, arms, and core. Uh, there's a, the stress is spread out throughout the entire body during a pro for a program like that. Um, but you can still make great results. Uh, in fact, it allows longer recovery between there's not quite as much stress put on those muscle groups like there is with a push pull legs. Um, so it really depends. Like if a client really wants to build their arms, I would probably have them follow something where they're really prioritizing the weaker muscle group they want to bring up. Um, so Next to that is intensity. <laughs> I, uh, I work out in my home gym and I can scream and yell and make weird faces and noises all I want, which is absolutely necessary for knowing that you're hitting that intense part of training. But when you go to the gym, I mean, sometimes I, I public gyms, like I'll see some things and I'm like, whoa, like this is, this is what's going on out here outside of my home gym. And, mm -hmm. um, and people are, you know, they're working hard. There's some people that are just, you can tell they're, they're really doing it. You know, they're invested. And then there are other people who, um, they're walking around a lot. They're looking at their phone. They're resting for four minutes between sets. Um, the intensity isn't quite there. Maybe they need a spotter, but they don't have one. So they can't push themselves quite as hard. So intensity is a big part of building muscle and, making sure that you're paying attention to rate of perceived exertion. How hard is this? How hard does, it, does this feel? Um, even reps and reserve, how many reps do I have left? Uh, but you have to come into the gym with intent. Part of that intent is the program. Um, 
You have to have that focus, that connection to your goals, the, the emotional connection. Why do I want this? Because if you wake up and you're like, eh, I got a goal, but like, I'm, I'm tired. So hmm, I don't care. I'll skip the gym today. And I'll try again tomorrow. It's like, hey, you really have to have a heart to heart conversation with yourself around, <laughs> you know, how meaningful this really is and, and how bad you want it too, because, you know, you're going to have to have days where you train tired. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, again, look at your sleep, look at your stress, look at your recovery. Maybe you do need a day off from the gym. Are, are you taking that recovery? That's part of following a program is there should be programmed rest days. So you're not just showing up like randomly training on random days without any sort of plan. You're, you're setting aside time to, to rest because that's where you're going to get stronger. That's where you're going to improve. So that's something that should be considered for sure valuable, valuable information, because I think, you know, both ends of the spectrum, right? Because we've all seen it. I mean, you're, you're with me in Miami watching people take all their selfies while they're on mm -hmm. the machines. You're just like, uh, -huh. okay, yeah. you're really working out hard. Um, and then you've got, you know, the old school, like power lifters in the corner, you know, with their grunting and faces and the guys like boxing in between, you know, you, you've got the whole thing. But I think when we work out at home, to a certain extent, some people will not push themselves as much. And I know myself, I'm calling myself out that like, I compared to being in a gym, because, you know, I'll see other people in the gym, like, oh, I can't let them lift less me, you know, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny how you get that. So, you know, I guess it's one of those things of being being self motivated, but also having a coach that can call you out and be like, hey, maybe we need to bump the intensity up. Do you think do you think intensity for women over 40? Because you know how social media and lots of like research studies have said, oh, intensity might wear your adrenals out. Maybe it's not so great for you. Do you think that we've been kind of blunted in the in intensity and that we probably could do a little short burst intensity a little more than we think we could, but we've been told maybe that's a bad idea? I think, you know, so hit style training where your heart rate is getting really high um, and really high is relative. It will, it will depend a lot on resting heart rate, the individual person. Um, but hit style training, I think can potentially get you, get you into those places where you're feeling that extra high cortisol, your just the central nervous system fatigue that you can't seem to overcome with the way that I like to train. When I think of intensity, um, my heart rate is fairly low because I'm focused more on hypertrophy building muscle. Um, and I focus a lot on slow tempo. So like for, for anyone trying to build muscle men or women prioritizing that slower eccentric, the lowering phase of say like a push up or a barbell bench press where you're coming down, taking two to three seconds about controlling it. And then exaggerating or holding that stretched position. I mean, that's really where you're going to get this, this muscle building benefit is focusing on that. And my heart rate's not coming up, not very high. Now for leg, mm -hmm. leg work, it's going to come up more. That's to be expected. Um, but I'm not, you know, sprinting with 180 beats per minute heart rate. Uh, I might get my heart rate up into the one forties during a leg workout or something like that. Um, but I'm taking longer rest periods too. And this is something I think is really important for a lot of people to understand. If you're trying to build muscle, you do have to slow down. Uh, you, you're not doing a hit boot camp workout during strength training workouts. You, you may during a hit workout get the benefit of building muscle, especially if you're taking the proper, um, you're doing all the right things with recovery. Your sleep is good. Your nutrition is great. Protein is up. You're managing stress. Um, but there are a lot of things that take from us all throughout our days, weeks, months, and years and compound over time, especially as we get older and life stressors kick in and we got all kinds of stuff that we're juggling. Uh, so you do have to factor that in. Um, I do mindfulness meditation five days a week on average, and it is something I've experimented with doing a lot of and then kicking out of my routine to see, does this really matter? Do I really need this? Is it even helping me? And the answer is yes, it has helped me a lot. And just having an opportunity for this introspection period for 10, 15 minutes where I can just be quiet, focus on my breathing. I don't listen to anything. In fact, I wear earplugs a lot. So I'm trying to keep it quiet, shut off the lights. Um, so I can really check in with myself. And 
I've learned over the course of time, and I think this is what we should all do, is to pay attention to what we're thinking, feeling, and experiencing. And, you know, what's my heart rate doing right now? What do I, do I feel recovered? Do I have this central nervous system fatigue where I feel kind of high cortisol? Um, so you're doing a sort of a daily check-in. And if you have a social group or you're working with a therapist, it's like, it's even better. You're journaling. You have all these different ways of checking in with yourself to see what's going on inside of you. Um, and then to be honest and really factoring that into the program you follow in the gym. And I really like to keep my intensity um, fairly low when I'm lifting. So I do like HIIT style. It's shown awesome benefits for heart health and longevity, um, but I can't do a lot of it. I've experimented with spinning like twice a week, really hardcore, like my heart rate. I was to the point where I couldn't even catch my breath half the time because it was so but I ended up gaining body fat. I was always exhausted. That's not the best method of training for me, what I've learned. And at 42, um, I know I've accumulated enough life experience and I've experimented with enough training protocols to know what best works for me. Um, walking a lot is awesome for me. I do push myself. The majority of my real hard push is in the mountains where I'm going uphill and I can't necessarily control the stressors around me, whether it's weather, wildlife, the incline of the mountain, the terrain. Um, my heart rate can be managed certain ways. I, I am a huge advocate of zone two cardio for just general fitness and health. Uh, so I do a lot of walking on the incline, uh, uh, treadmill, incline walking, and where my heart rate's like 120, 125 beats per minute. But what that ends up doing is lowering my heart rate when I go into those higher intensity activities. So I feel less stress all the way around now because I'm cardiovascularly more fit. Um, I don't feel that like intense cortisol, high intense, exhausted feeling. I don't let myself hang out in high heart rate zones uh, for long periods of time anymore. Um, and so I think it's just being very mindful of the program you're following and asking yourself, why am I doing this thing? You know, and if I don't feel well and I feel exhausted, I'm going to take an extra couple of days off and not feel guilty about that. There's not going to be any guilt or shame associated with backing off of something that depletes me and impacts my ability to live my life. Cause I have other responsibilities beyond the gym and my, my <laughs> business, you know? Um, and if you're a parent, you have a lot, a lot of things going on. If you have pets, you know, there are lots of social life, all kinds of stuff. You mm -hmm. have to factor in and ask yourself and check in with yourself, having those conversations around what am I doing? Why am I doing this? How do I feel? And how can I make this program fit my life to where I'm happy? And there's no distress around obligations and schedules and things like that. So, yeah valuable valuable advice i mean it, it makes me think you know kind of like how you're training to to hike right and i think my my thing for folks i'm always kind of being like you know the more you can get outdoors the more you can challenge yourself yes you are going to be more cardiovascularly balanced when stress comes at you and one of my favorites i i do think and this is my personal opinion myself i've noticed i do well with walking hiking kind of workouts too i feel like that's the challenge where a lot of people shine Let's say, let's say, especially women, I don't know, maybe we're like pack, we're pack animals or something. We need to like hike some stuff and we feel better. Can you, can you shed some light on like when you have some folks that are training or even your own training for climbing, you know, hiking the mountains, things of that nature. Um, when I lived in Colorado, we were always talking about how to train for 14ers and things of that nature. But a lot of folks are just looking at altitude. You know, maybe we've got a 2000 elevation that we've got to go up or down for that matter. I think down's worse these days on me, <laughs> but yeah. tell us, tell us a little bit about what you have folks in the gym doing to, to transition into, to the hiking or yourself included. I would love to hear. Yeah. The best thing that I could suggest for getting better at hiking is to get out and hike as much as you can. And that can be tricky again here in the wintertime or anywhere where you're, you have access to mountains, but it's, they're covered in snow. A lot of people hear backcountry ski, which is awesome. I do not, um, but they're hiking up or skinning up and they're skiing down. Mm -hmm. So they're not getting that benefit or, or challenge of the stress on the body muscularly with the skiing down, but um, still lots of fun to ski down a mountain. Um, so I would say get out as early as you can. As soon as we knew that some of our mountains were clearing that we could safely um, summit, we got out and we started hiking. 
Now, what this does for me in the gym is it takes away at least one of my strength days because I'm recovering generally. I hike every Sunday. Um, I'm actually hiking uh, later today. And so, so this kind of throws me off a little bit today where I'm not usually, I'm usually strength training on Fridays, um, and maybe doing some zone two cardio, but Sundays are my big day. So I know Monday is going to be a zone two recovery kind of workout post hike. Um, and so, you know, you, you do have to be mindful of how hard you're working your legs in the gym too. So you're program may have to be changed. Uh, for me, I can't work through a lot of intense leg soreness and that will depend on the steepness of the mountain you're climbing, because as you're coming down, as you know, it's getting the knees, it's burning the quads. The next day you've got delayed onset muscle soreness or for the next like four days <laughs> on the length of the mountain or, you know, or the trail or the, the time you're out there in the, in the elevation. Um, and so definitely making sure that you've got as if you're carrying a pack too, that you have, you're working on upper back strength, core strength. Um, I really like different variations of Paloff press for core strength, plank, different variations of plank is great. I'm not opposed to flexion uh, stuff like crunches and decline crunches and things. Uh, I like to vary it up. I love the ab wheel. Uh, so core stuff, hip stuff, glute strength, um, single leg work. So whether it's a single leg RDL or Bulgarian split squats or some of my favorite, but really working on that slow tempo and the eccentric and pausing in the end, end range of the eccentric. So you're not only just, you know, going through the leg workout, but you're working on full range of motion. Um, stability and balance are really important too. Cause when you're hiking, you know, you're, you're off balance. You're, work, you're walking on terrain that is mud, rocks, roots, possibly wet mud, um, steep up and down. Uh, so really just making sure you're taking good, good care of your feet as well. So, um, we do a lot of foot rolling with our clients, a lot of barefoot training. If people want to go barefoot, uh, suggestions to walk in your home barefoot. So you're, you're barefoot as much as possible, as long as you can handle that, there's no injuries or things to work around there. Um, uh, but upper back strength too. So carrying the pack can be hard on like the traps and the neck and the, it's like pulling you into flexion. Um, so yeah, just really prioritizing things where you're working that like face pulls and uh, like even pull-ups and stuff too, just things where you're, you're, you are prioritizing good technique in the gym. You're not just going through the motions because you're thinking about, well, how's this going to benefit that activity? I really love to do outside of the gym, uh, which for me is hiking. So um, correlating the why again, why am I doing this to, you know, the, whatever you're following in the gym, whatever program. Awesome. Awesome. So just because I'm curious and probably maybe some other folks might be familiar with Alaska, what are you hiking tonight or this evening? Oh, today, um, we are going to go hike a 12 mile, uh, traverse from a, a small mountain called the dome up, up to about 4,500 feet elevation, through Noya Peak and then um I'm not sure can she peak as I think it's all these peaks connected through the Chugach range outside of Anchorage. So it's only about 20 minutes from my house. Oh. Um but we have a mountain range. So if you've ever flown into like Salt Lake City and they have the front range there, that's how it looks here in Anchorage is it's all the the mountains are right there. So uh we're very lucky. It's you know, we could skip the gym and just go to the mountains. So, oh my gosh, yeah. See, that's that's my problem. I love lifting, but I I have a I have a pull towards the mountains, like some magnetics. Going oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. I get it. I get it. Everywhere I go, I'm like, where are the mountains? Yep. Yes. Yes. Oh man. Yeah. You and I need to hike sometime here here yeah. in the new future because boy, it's yeah. it's my jam. It's my jam. I love well, it. Gosh, Steph, you've you've covered so many things and. I mean, I know I could talk to you for hours about all the other, pick your brain about supplements and all the like magical things out there. But for now, I think we'll let folks just chew on what they can do to work on, on the basics first and, and we can move on from there. So let's talk about, let's talk about your podcast. Let's talk about finding you on Instagram, finding you on your website, if they, uh, check out what it's like to work with you. Give us, give us a rundown on all of them for Figurelli's Fitness. Yeah. So uh, I have a podcast called the fit fig podcast. Uh, it's on iTunes and Spotify. You can also find it on my website, which is figurellisfitness.com. 
Um, and yeah, Instagram, Figarelli's underscore fitness. We, um, yeah, we just, we do online coaching in person, private training and small group. Um, we do nutrition coaching primarily with teaching people how to track their macros and, um, really just get familiar. Like we were talking about earlier before we started, uh, our contact page on our website is by design, a little bit intimidating because we do ask for certain things. Um, and that, you know, that kind of puts people off. I understand. And, uh, people have choices, you know, you don't have to necessarily, uh, jump through our hoops, but we do like to know our clients. Um, we want to make sure we're a good fit for people. We do set up phone consultations before we even start with a client to even make sure that we're a good fit before we move further. So there are no questions. And, um, we love communicating with our people. We love getting to know them. We love helping them. We love helping people uh, to realize that they have a lot more um, control over their goals and their ideas and their lifestyle than they might think. And so it's empowering to help people empower themselves really through training and just living an awesome life. My gosh, that's so well said. It's so well said because really, if you can get someone to really look at fitness as a different thing than being like this grind and and having the love that we have for it, it just opens up so many doors. It um, If you think about your fitness as enabling you to amplify every life experience, that's how I think about it. You know, nothing is off limits, really. You, If you're physically fit, you can do anything. You can if you're physically fit, you're very likely cognitively functioning at a high level. Your memory is good. Your mood is really good. And there's a very uh, tight correlation connection to mind and body. And so they're, they're one. And so, you know, when you feel good, you're, you're better for people in your life too. And it's just contagious. And then it's, people are, you know, excited and enthusiastic about their own life and their own fitness. So yeah, it's not just grinding away in the gym for no reason, excuse me, no reason. It's actually having this energy that is contagious. That's like setting an example for the people in your life and, and then that, that so on and so forth. So yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Well, I absolutely love what you get going on on Instagram. It's inspiring to see what you guys are up to and, you know, everything that you guys are up to and, and your podcast to the fit fig is fun. You guys, you got to check that out. Good inspiration there. And some, some good topics, you know, you get real. I like it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, just really appreciate it. Yeah. My pleasure. My pleasure. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the health fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast, subscribe, rate and review and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.